Good evening and welcome to Studs and Science. My name is Jason Hill and I'm a conservation biologist here at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. And it, it is great to see and talk with so many folks. Um, before we get started tonight, I just wanted to talk to you about my philosophy for science and why we do Studs and Science um, the way we do. So when you register for an event, I give you the opportunity to ask questions to the speaker. And then I take those questions and I summarize them and I chop them up and I put light questions together. And I, I try to give um, a voice to your questions. I try to include you at the table. My philosophy is sci of science is that it's best and strongest when as many people, many stakeholders as possible are present at the table. And that's what I'm trying to do. I take your questions and then um, Dr. Laws, in, in the case of tonight, we we sit down via Zoom and I we go over a few things. Hey, are you comfortable talking about this? Is this in your you know wheelhouse of knowledge? And I ask our science speaker, what subjects would you really like to talk about? Make sure that you're heard on tonight. And this approach where I try to give everyone an opportunity to be heard, I feel, is a more equitable and democratic way to discuss science rather than a traditional lecture series where it's one person you know, preemptively deciding what to talk to you about. And so that's my philosophy for SEDS and Science. And we used to meet at a local brew pub right down the street, and I recognize that this format is, is not that, but I appreciate you sticking with us and, and being here tonight. And in talking about being equitable and giving everyone a voice, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you're gonna notice there's a chat function down there. And I've enabled it so that you can chat to other individual participants in tonight. And you can also ask questions as well um, at any time to me. And if I, if Dr. Laws and I are talking about butterflies and you have a really pressing question about road beetles, you know, maybe you wait until an, a time where this fits in a little better in the conversation or wait till the designated, you know, question and answer session. But at any time tonight, if there's something you want some clarification on or I have a question that's directly relevant to what we're talking about that would fit right in, go ahead and ask that right in the chat. And I'll try to, I'll try to bring that in. Um, into the question. And I also welcome people's comments. We have so many people of uh, expertise, professional entomologists in attendance tonight, as well as incredibly passionate, enthusiastic naturalists who are here with lots of experience. And I welcome you to chime in with your comments um, in the chat function as well. Tonight's video is being recorded as well as the chat will be transcribed and I'll make all those files available to you. So people post links to really cool websites that list native plants for our region or something. That information will be available to you when you download the chat on our website afterwards. Don't worry, you don't have to frantically, um, you know, write all these things down. Um, so with that, in mentioning that chat function, right down there at the bottom of the screen, go ahead and click on that chat function and as a blatant icebreaker, nothing else. If you would tell me, what insect you would be if you could be any insect in the world. And while you do that, I just want to acknowledge that um, my house is based here in White River Junction, which is the historical lands of the Abenaki. And right now it's sugaring season here in Vermont. And I can't help but think of the um, ingenuity and strength and perseverance it must have taken for Abenaki and other indigenous cultures here to come up with sugaring to invent sugaring thousands of years before Europeans did and to exist on this landscape more than 10,000 years ago. And I especially think about the ingenuity and strength and perseverance it has taken for the Abenaki to exist here, especially in the last 500 years. And I offer my, um, my humble praise. Um, and it's a, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, I would like to introduce or like to give our speaker tonight, Dr. Angela Laws from the Xerxes Society, an opportunity to introduce herself. I always prefer to introduce myself because I'm very, I see myself in a certain way, which apparently nobody else sees me that way. So I like to introduce myself. So Dr. Angela Laws, it is such a pleasure to have you here tonight. Um, welcome to, to Vermont Studs of Science. Thanks, everyone. I'm really happy to be here today. 
So I'm a biologist with the Xerces Society. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Xerces, we're a nonprofit focused on protecting biodiversity by protecting invertebrates. And a lot of our work is on pollinators. My work, um, I do a lot of work with pollinators and monarchs. So working with different agencies and landowners to create habitat and also um, create management plans that will um, benefit pollinators and, and monarch butterflies. I've been with Xerces for three years. Prior to that, I spent about 20 years doing field research on grassland invertebrates, mostly grasshoppers and wolf spiders. But I'm really happy to be here today. Looking forward to chatting with all of you about insects. Yeah, I, I forgot, Angela. You and I were talking earlier last week, and you and I both worked at Conza Prairie in Kansas. Oh, yeah. Kansas yeah, State. it's... Is, One of my favorite you, places. Is that where you got your start, so to speak, or? No, I, <laughs> I started out at Utah State and I got an undergraduate, um, those undergrad grants to do research with grasshoppers <laughs> at um, the National Bison Range in Montana, near Blackhead Lake. It's beautiful yeah, sure. there. Yeah, so I've got to work in a lot of different grasslands. I worked in some old fields in the UP, Kansa Prairie, Coastal Prairie. It's moved around a lot before um, moving to Xerces. I, know. I miss I miss the Flathead Valley and that area. I mean, that's so beautiful. Years. Yeah. 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 Um, yep. I, I want to jump right into it uh, with a just a really challenging question to you. <laughs> um, UV ultraviolet uh, black light bug zappers. Worst <laughs> invention on the planet or worst invention in the solar system? Discuss. <laughs> uh, you know, so, I, you know, when I talk about as someone who spends a lot of my free time taking macro photography of insects and I'm very interested in insects. Oh, I forgot to say, I know I'm not a journalist, but I have to freely acknowledge that I am a monthly contributing member to Xerces Society. So, that, <laughs> you feel that bias is my questions anyway. But uh, when I mention insects to people, I often get, oh, you mean like cockroaches and mosquitoes. And um, so many people think about pests when we talk about insects. But I mean, we should maybe just start out talking about some of the benefits and ecosystem services that insects provide for humans. Right. Insects, I mean, they're the most abundant and diverse group of animals on the planet. And so they contribute to just about any ecosystem service you can think of. I mean, I think one of the most obvious is pollination. Most, I think it's like 85% of all flowering plants require a pollinator to reproduce and insects are the primary um, pollinators that provide that service. But they also are really important for um, nutrient cycling, decomposition, um, food webs, they're so, because they're near the base of the food web, they're an important food source for so many other animals. And in grasslands, people hate grasshoppers, but um, grasshoppers are such an important food source for birds. Um, so having this really fun conversation once at a, a, um, a symposium about, with this uh, biologist who studied grasslands and South Africa. And so he lives in an environment where there are all these huge herbivores. And so he was kind of teasing us about like in, in North America, all of our megafauna are gone. So the <laughs> ecologists are all reduced to, hey, look, an insect eating a leaf. And so <laughs> we look at insects, but they're not important was what he was arguing. But we did get him to agree that dung beetles are very important insects and in South Africa, <laughs> especially without dung beetles, um, it would, <laughs> with all those large um, herbivores, it'd be a very unpleasant place to be, I think, without dung beetles. <laughs> so, they, so they're very important to so many different um, ecosystem services. You, I, I think, I think in, insects constitute something like 80% of the world's described species. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think they occupy 80% of our you know, conservation efforts? Absolutely not. I think mm -hmm. that people, people don't, yeah, people learn to dislike insects. Like I've done 
outreach with kids. And it's so much fun because kids haven't learned yet, especially if they're really young, they haven't learned yet to be grossed out by, by bugs. And so they have fun and they're collecting insects and holding them and playing with them. And as somewhere along the line, as we get older, we get this aversion to insects. And I think that that certainly affects what species we focus our conservation efforts on. And even, even now when there's a growing awareness of how important pollinators are, there is only one bee protected by the Endangered Species Act. There's now a second bee that's a candidate species. But certainly, there are a lot of butterflies, but they're pretty, right? So there's this focus towards dragonflies and butterflies and lovely insects kind of get, I think they get um, compartmentalized. There's those, those insects and then there's all the other gross insects that people don't like. They're actually wonderful when you start to get to get to know them. Gross insect, gross insects is not like an actual scientific taxonomic categorization, is it? No, the societal. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, I mean, even in the bird world, we are guilty of that as well with charismatic, um, colorful birds receiving more relative, more conservation attention and more imagination, captured more imagination of the public. You mentioned working with kids or working with an early age. Um, you know, do you feel like we are making inroads actually in in converting the public to be concerned about insect, the plight of insect populations? Um, you know, especially beyond like some of our you know, charismatic monarchs and uh, yeah, some of those species, uh, honeybees, Puritan tiger beetles, some that get a lot of conservation attention. Yeah, I mean, I feel, I do feel like there is growing interest in, in the natural world. I feel like there's apps like iNaturalist that I think help the gateway to get people excited and exploring the world around them. I think maybe COVID has helped because you're hanging out in your local park or your yard and, um, feel like there are more like insect collecting kits for sale now and that kind of thing. So there is, an, is a growing interest. And I do feel like, I feel like there was a lot of media attention, a lot of attention to um, declines in honeybees. And I feel like that really resonated with people. And now there's been a lot of focus on all these long-term studies showing global declines in all kinds of insects called the, the insect apocalypse. And I feel like that has started to capture people's attention. I do think we still have a long ways to go, but I've, I think maybe it's, it's starting to shift. And I do think, you know, in, in California, for example, we have many species of butterflies that are just as imperiled or even more so than the monarch, but the monarch gets all the attention. And I, but I think they make a great gateway butterfly. Gateway they care about the species, yeah. And then start to pay attention to the other, other things around them. You, you mentioned the insect apocalypse. You know, even our, my local paper here in the Upper Valley, Vermont, New Hampshire, has covered the insect apocalypse in a number of articles. Um, and I'm, I bet a lot of people on the call tonight are familiar with that. But uh, I mean, could you just maybe highlight some examples uh, um, evidence for insect declines and you know, how taxonomically diverse is that? Is it, is it just butterflies that are declining or? Well, a lot of the data are for butterflies. And I think, again, it's because they're lovely and people like to collect them. And so a lot of the data that we have telling us that, that we're experiencing these huge declines in insects come from long-term data sets. So it makes sense that it's things that people like to collect, like butterflies. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, long-term data sets for butterflies around the world, um, but there are other taxa as well. So there have been a few review papers looking at where studies have, been, have shown declines in either insect abundance or number of species, and then what taxa. And it seems to be there are studies all over the world, though they are concentrated in the US and Europe at least uh, the studies that are published in the journals that are, are looked at by, the, by these reviews. And then um, it's all different taxa. So it does seem to be sort of a widespread phenomena. Of course, some species are doing well, um, but in general, there does seem to be this trend of big declines in insect abundance. 
where we have long-term data to look at that. Yeah, I, I've heard you talk before about the, uh, the windshield effect. Mm -hmm. and, and that's like a viable research technique now. It's not, not, <laughs> I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's like driving around your car and like measuring the surface area of the windshield that's covered with <laughs> dead insects. Um, what, 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 you know, I, I think some of us are probably more have heard of some of the examples from, from Europe about insect declines. Um, could you, could you talk about some of those or highlight some of those? Or, uh, so there was one in Germany um, where they have a long-term, they've been doing long-term studies where they collect flying insects. Hmm. And that one, um, that's in a preserve. So it's an area that's relatively protected from habitat degradation and, and pesticides. Um, and they found, I think it was a 70% decline in the abundance of this, of the biomass. So you collect all the insects and weigh them. So there was a huge decline in the um, biomass of flying insects in that study. There have been some studies in the UK showing big declines in butterflies over time. Um, that's the that's the hall. Well, it's the butterfly. I was just reading about that. The Hallman. It's the Hallman study. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So finding many many species disappearing over time, and then so changes in the composition of the species. So you have fewer species overall, and then the abundance is lower. And there was, I mean, there've been a lot of those studies coming out. There was one from Singapore just uh, a few months ago, also looking at declines in, in the number of butterfly species in Singapore. Um, or I think it was over 50 years. So there's just a lot of different examples coming out. Um, you know, people use different methods. One, one problem is that, you know, we can't say exactly what the cause is for any one of these species. We don't always know the mechanisms. It's probably a mix of things and, and the relative importance of different factors might change over space or time. So we can't always highlight a mechanism. Um, and I think that sometimes makes some scientists uncomfortable because we can't say for sure this is the cause. Um, but it does seem to be a pattern that we're seeing a lot. Um, I mean, there are other insects that are doing quite well. Um, it's, it's a mixed bag, I think. Do you get the, the sense that, so in, at least in the ornithological literature, um, the species that appear to be most at risk of extinction are those specialist species and, and, and long distance migrants, but species that are more generalist and stationary tend to, with exceptions, tend to be faring better. Is that is that a pattern that's seen in the in the insect world as well? You know, I don't know how general that is. I know there's a 45 year data set for butterflies in Northern California. And in general, what they're finding is the species that it, it, it has to do. So the species at elevation sites are experiencing really rapid declines in the recent past whereas species in the Central Valley have been um, consistently declining over time. And for the ones at the high elevation, what they're finding is that a lot of it has to do with temperature tolerance. So are they um, negatively affected by warmer, warmer nights and, and um, just warmer temperatures overall? And so it can be traits like that. I think it depends on where you are and what is the primary driver? Is it pesticides? Is it climate change? Is it habitat loss? It's going to affect um, which species are most vulnerable. Um, so it's it's hard to say. Yeah, I, I totally I could see the high elevations um, um, being highly susceptible. I you know I do a lot a lot of my research is high elevation, so mm. spur forest and you know mountains in general warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Mount peaks warming something like five times the background warming rate for the world. So, mm -hmm. and of course, those species have nowhere to go. Right? Exactly. You can't move up slope. You could move, you know, lap, you can move towards the poles, um, but you're also generally going down in elevation as well as you do so. Um, yeah. You mentioned climate change in, in the Hallman study that in Germany that took place on protected lands, suggesting that at least in that case that. Uh, 
habitat loss maybe isn't so, so much of a factor in those butterfly declines in Germany, but um, what, what are some of the suspected main drivers for global insect population declines? So I think it's a lot of the usual suspects, right? Habitat loss is a huge driver of biodiversity declines for all sorts of, of, of taxa. Um, not just insects. So that's that's a big one. Um, and land use change. Um, I think pesticides are a really important driver of insect declines. And I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, climate change, pollution, disease um, with pollinators. Uh, we know that honeybees are susceptible to several diseases and honeybees can transfer those disease to wild pollinators. So, um, you know, introduce species diseases, all of these things can play a role. I think those are the, the big, big drivers. I would say that's like death by a thousand cuts, but I think you listed maybe top seven. Yeah, so yeah. So death by seven. Right. Cuts. It's so many different, <laughs> just getting hit from all sides. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm curious, you know, how, I, how, do, how does climate change actually affect insect population? Or how do we suspect it will? Expected it. There's a lot of different ways. I think the most common things people talk about are potential rain shifts. So kind of what we were talking about with high al altitude species. Species could move up in altitude. They can move to higher latitudes to try and track um, the conditions that they're adapted to. Though not all species will move. Um, some North American bumblebees, we've noticed that their ranges seem to be contracting in the south, but not expanding in the north. So mm -hmm. it's not it's not a given. Um, phenology changes um, are often talked about, especially with pollinators. This is important. So phenology is the timing of biological events. And you can think about a specialist bee that um, pollinates a particular species of flower the bees and flowers emerge at the same time, but if the pollinators and the plants are responding to different cues, like maybe one's responding to temperature, humidity, and another one's responding to daylight, those, um, those cues can get misaligned. So that's a problem. But also other things like species interactions can change, especially for insects where temperature drives so much of their biology. It affects their survival, their reproduction, how big they are when they're adults, how many offspring they produce, um, how fast they digest, how how um, many much nutrients they can get from their food, and how much uh, energy they need. So I think temperature is really important um, to insects in particular. It can affect so many of their traits, and then of course you've got the plants are being affected, right? Plant composition, plant quality can change, the climate change. Um, there's some cool new research showing that carbon dioxide, when you, when you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it can change the nutritional quality of pollen and nature and, and nectar or the attractiveness of plants. So there are all sorts of, of things like that. And of course they can all interact. And then the other big one is that climate change has the potential to interact with all of those other factors that I mentioned, like pesticide use or, or habitat loss, right? Like you might think of a scenario where a, an insect gets exposed to a pesticide and it doesn't kill it, it's sublethal, but maybe during a drought or heat wave, that pesticide exposure could become lethal. So there's all of <laughs> this building complexity of, of, of these interactions between all these factors and all these potential ways that climate change can affect species and um, predicting how any individual species is going to respond is, gets really tricky. Right on. You, you, you mentioned pesticides, and I, I got, yeah. got a lot of questions tonight when people signed up about pesticides, specifically about uh, you know, nicotinoids. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask, you know, uh, could you help us understand you know, what, um, especially neonics, what, what are neonics and why are they thought to be so dangerous for insects? So um, neonicotinoids are a class of pesticides that are systemic. They're highly toxic to bees. They can stay in the environment for a really long time, like months or sometimes years. And when I say that they're systemic, what that means is that 
they get taken up by the plant and expressed in all the plant tissues. So maybe you spray the leaf of a plant with this pesticide, but that pesticide is gonna get absorbed by the plant and it will show up in the pollen and the nectar. The other problem is, is that it gets in the soil and gets taken up by the surrounding plants. So maybe you have a pollinator garden and you've been really careful not to spray any neonics, but you buy a plant from a nursery that has been treated with neonics. Those pesticides are gonna get in the soil and contaminate all of the plants surrounding that plant. So it's a really um, problematic, it's, it's, a really, it's really problematic for um, pollinators and other insects and all of the animals that rely on insects and birds. Um, something that we need to, to get a handle on. And I think, I think a lot of people, when they think of pesticides, they think of agriculture. And yes, we do use a lot of pesticides in our agriculture, but pesticide use can be just as high in urban areas. And I think that's something that we need to think about. Yeah, how we can fix that. I, I just looked before we started and I was looking up, we, in the United States here, we need to dispense something like a billion pounds of pesticides a year here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, crazy. Just, just to be clear, you said that so, so even if we are really careful in our own gardens, we could buy plants from some nursery, from some big box store potentially, that would have already been treated with neonics and then yeah. that could be transferred to the soil, which could stay there and then be taken up by the other plants and, and yeah. then insects there exposed. That's awful. That's like Yeah, it's really disturbing. And we we did a study, so this was in California. But we collected 227 milkweed plants from around the valley. So milkweed is the host plant for monarchs. And then we tested them for pesticides, and every single plant had pesticides, every single one, with an average of nine different types of pesticides. Now, we have a lot of different pesticides in California because we grow a lot of different kinds of crops, but still, we were collecting samples from the middle of national wildlife refuges, from the backyards of Xerxes employees. <laughs> and so every single sample had pesticides. And so that's the other thing to think about. Maybe you're careful about what you use and what you plant, but your neighbor might not be. And so you've got drift is an issue. But the samples that had the highest number of pesticides, around 25, were the ones we purchased from, from nurseries. So we, we have, um, a new fact sheet out on our website if you're interested in this on buying bee safe plants. And we've got some days of action coming up where um, you can sign up and it gives you like a series of questions to ask at your local nursery. And then you fill out the form and tell you what they say, but trying to get consumers to push their nurseries to stop <laughs> using these really toxic pesticides on their plants. Um, so you can find that on our website if you're interested in getting involved in that. And, and so are the plants, trying to understand, they're, they're pre-treated before this? Yeah, well, and the, there's several steps. So like the plants at your nursery might not have been grown from seeds at that nursery. They might have been sourced from somewhere else. And so, yeah, they spray at the nursery so that the plant looks lovely and doesn't have any leaf damage or signs that any herbivores have been near it. Um, and so, yeah, they get sprayed and, and each step in the pipeline that, that makes it show up at Home Depot or wherever you're buying your plants um, may be spraying something different, which is why you get this accumulation of all these different pesticides or, or can potentially. Um, so just knowing where you're buying your plants um, and asking them what they're using on it can be really beneficial for pollinators and, and other insects um, in our we, we had uh, someone registered tonight and asked a question about the a UK study that found widespread contamination of UK rivers um, from neonics and speculated that it was partially responsible, for, partially due to, um, oh, wish, what that person helped me out here, uh, pet, pet flea collars. Oh. Neonics put into flea collars, and then and then through the uh, excrement being flushed in the toilet and getting into the water supply, but also sitting on the ground that it that it's passed into the local environment. 
Wow, I did not know that neonics were in flea collars. That's crazy. It's interesting because the UK is generally better at regulating some of these. Well, it's, it's, in California, are you are you y'all about to prohibit neonics, or what's what's the status of that? Or no, um, <laughs> I don't think that's on the horizon. Oh, I thought uh, that was coming up or trying to be happening. I, there are people working on it. One of the things we've been trying is just to get seed treated, seeds treated with the neonics classified as pesticide use because a lot of times that flies under the radar. Have you guys heard about that um, ethanol plant in Nebraska that was using yes. uh, seed treated with neonics and it was contaminating the whole area. And so the this treated seed is treated differently than just spraying pesticide. So that is one of the things we're working on is trying to get that classified and, and regulated. Um, but it's, it's difficult. Um, yeah. Yeah. As someone who raises a lot of plants, I, I, I think what I really appreciate knowing was some kind of labeling, at least to, at least to be knowledgeable of when that, when I buy in something that's been preemptively treated or has been, yeah. Some kind of proximity to, to those pesticides. I would love to know that. So one of the milkweed plants that we buy, bought did say neonic free, and it was not neonic free. Gosh. So, I mean, and again, that may be an issue of drift or. I, you know, I, I'm from Iowa originally. I grew up in a, surrounded by corn and soybean fields, worked on the soybean farm in the summer. Um, there's a lot of emphasis right now for, for monarch conservation uh, paying farmers in Iowa and the Midwest to, mm -hmm. to plant native species immediately adjacent in the ditches and the margins of fields. And you're making me think, wow, so that's, you know, it, yes, it's providing habitat, much like CRP does for birds and other animals, but it's almost a guaranteed heavy pesticide exposure to those plants in that environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's true. That's definitely something that we need to think about and just working with farmers, giving them more tools for integrated pest management um, and maybe thinking about pesticide drift barriers in between the fields and those habitat. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's definitely a concern. Um, I, I know a number of people asked about Western honeybees and you and I spoke previously about that. Um, you know, a friend of mine who is uh, an entomologist who's, who's on the call tonight uh, described honeybees to me in an eye-opening way one time as the, the non-native domestic cattle of the insect world, which I was like, oh, you know, and <laughs> it's an interesting, it's a really interesting thing for me, you know, to think about, you know, so there's a lot of attention paid to, uh, to colony collapse and all the diseases and parasites of honeybees. And honeybees are non-native species to North America. And it's interesting to me that interesting bedfellows of lumping honeybees in with the, the plight of our native insects. Um, I see some advantages and disadvantages of that though. I mean, what are, I guess, what are some of the cons and pros of that approach? Yeah. So I, I also like to think of honeybees as livestock. Like they're really it's important. Livestock. They're really important to our economy, to agriculture. They're fascinating animals. Um, but when I, I sometimes hear people say, oh, I'm really concerned. I want to help save the bees. So I got a honeybee hive. And there are lots of reasons to get a honeybee hive, but conservation isn't one. I feel like that would be like, yeah, I'm worried about endangered species. So I bought a cow. And that doesn't really <laughs> have these chickens. Um, honeybees are fascinating. I mean, I know that people get a lot of enjoyment for, for um, raising honeybee hives, and that's great. I think some of the pros, I think, are that people are just aware of what's happening with honeybees. People are worried about honeybees, and I think that opens up a lot of the conversation for people to be thinking about what's happening with pollinators and our native pollinators. I think that a lot of people just don't know that there are other bees. Like I've done outreach events where I ask people to guess how many bees are in California or in the in North America. And I think a high guess would be like a hundred species. 
And there's like 3,600 species approximately in the US and Canada. So there's so many species. And I think people just don't, don't know. Um, and so it's by lumping them together, I guess, as a way to get people concerned about pollinators in general and interested in that. Yeah. But I think the negatives is, is that there, there, it's not settled, but there is growing evidence that honeybees can outcompete native bees. So if you have a lot of high density of honeybees, they can drive down the populations of native bees potentially. And so I think that is one problem where if you have people deciding, you know, they're gonna have more honeybees or set up a honeybee hive to try and save the bees, um, it's maybe not the best thing to do for wild bees. Best thing you could do would be just planting some flowers and keeping them, not spraying them. Um, speaking of, of planting flowers, I know that there's a big push here in, in the New England and elsewhere to plant milkweed everywhere, uh, uh -huh. post, post plant for monarchs. Um, monarch situation in California seems dire and out Western United States, to say the least. You know, a lot of us probably wear fish and wildlife in December said monarch should be listed, but boy, we have a couple hundred species we got to get to before that. And then I think they, I think it was 2024, they suggested they may come back to revisit monarchs being listed. Are there going to be monarchs in the Western United States 2024? <laughs> so it's pretty bleak. Um, for those of you who don't follow it, uh, we organize a count of butterflies along the California coast. So the Western monarchs breed generally west of the, monarch, of the Rocky Mountains and overwinter along the California coast. And then the Eastern monarchs breed east of the Rockies and overwinter in Mexico. So we organized um, a community science um, project where people help us count monarchs in the overwintering site. And so in 2018 and 20, the numbers when we started in 1997 were about 1.2 million monarchs kind of declined to around 200,000. In 2018 and 2019, that number dipped to 30,000. And then this winter, there were less than 2,000 monarchs along the California coast. In the 80s, it was estimated about 4 million monarchs. So it's a 99.9% .9 decline. It's a huge decline. Um, there do seem to be some resident populations. There's a resident population in Southern California and there was breeding all year in the Bay Area. So I don't know, it's possible that those populations will persist for a while and we just won't have a migratory population unless we can get the population to bounce back. And one thing about insects is that their populations do vary a lot. So if we do the work, it's, it, we could still save this, the Western monarchs. Um, but I think we might have these um, kind of resident populations starting to show up. And I think there's just not a lot of data to understand what's going on there. Um, I think it's a mix of different things driving that. Um, different things like tropical milkweed that stays there all year. It's warmer, it's getting warmer. We had super warm winter, um, people rearing may be contributing, but we don't know how much. Uh, people purchasing monarch eggs and rearing them and releasing them. Um, we don't know how much of that is going on. So there's, it's just too new to say. So potentially, um, I'm sorry, just to make sure I understand you're potentially rearing monarchs from eggs, releasing them. You're saying is potentially a good thing or potentially spreads? Well, so anytime you're, we do not advocate purchasing monarch eggs. Um, and we don't advocate rearing as a conservation strategy. Like if you wanna rear a few a year for enjoyment or education, I think that's okay. But when you rear large numbers, there's the potential for disease. And especially with something like monarchs where they all go to one place, <laughs> oh, right. that can be problematic. There are some problems, um, there's some, you know, there are different degrees of, of what's happening. Uh, sometimes people are rearing them in their homes where it's a nice 70 degrees. And then um, if you're releasing them at, in winter, 
the butterflies don't know that it's winter because it's been 70 degrees their whole life and so they may not head to the overwintering sites. Um, but I know some people are rearing them outside just to protect them. Um, this paper, uh, these introduced paper wasps are do a number on the caterpillars. Um, but it also makes it hard to know what's going on. Like, is this a real stable population that's that's breeding year round in the Bay Area, or is it being supplemented by um, people breeding monarchs? We just don't know. Uh, so that's the main thing is we're, we're just uncertain about what's going on there. Wow, I, it makes me think of we're uncertain of such a well known visible species like monarchs. Just how many other species, butterflies, insects are flying under the radar. Oh yeah, there's so much research done on monarchs and there's still a lot we don't know. And there's, we've been working on this project for um, departments of transportation that, are in, that would be interested in creating pollinator habitat. And part of that is to write these profiles on imperiled pollinators. And it's amazing to me how many species, even species that are listed under the Endangered Species Act should, that should have a lot of um, conservation focus how many of them we still don't have like very good basic life history information on. Um, so a well, lot of work to do. Let's get on that everybody. All right. Yeah. After, after tonight, let's, let's <laughs> give you everything up. Right. <laughs> and uh, I'll take A through C. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, maybe here in our last question before we open it up for people to ask, um, uh, we had a lot of very specific questions about um, growing plants to benefit pollinators here in Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, and I, I'd encourage folks, if you, there were a lot of people curious about that, and I, I encourage you to post resources um, for your favorite, you know, uh, list, places to purchase native plants here in Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, and we have people from all over New England, and even the Midwest. Um, if you have some resources you'd like to share with people, go ahead and put those in the comments section. That'd be great. Um, maybe in our last question, my last question to you, Angela, I'd ask, um, what can we do individually you know, in our communities and around our own homes to, to benefit insect populations? I think there's a lot we can do. Um, and especially with something like insects or, or pollinators, I think that you get a payoff, which is kind of nice. I think that one thing we can do is just plant gardens, have native habitat in our yards. Um, I like to think of, you know, your yard or your garden as an opportunity to create a little ecosystem, right? Where you have herbivores and predators and um, just creating biodiversity. Uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence that planting native plants is really beneficial. Doug Tallamy has done a lot of really cool work on this, um, that if you have native plants, you're gonna support more insects, which can support more birds. Um, so planting, Planting native plants, maybe having a west lawn is another way to, to benefit insects. It's a wild idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like See, in California, oh, where yeah. we have a lot of drought, there's there's a push to get rid of your lawn, and the city will even give you like a rebate to do that. I don't know. Imagine in the Northeast, I think you guys are going to get more rain as the future goes. That's right. So rain gardens. Um, hmm are really beneficial. And then protecting those habitats from, from pesticides is another important thing you can do. Um, I think those are really important. Right on. And I, I feel like you get the payoff immediately. Like we moved into our house. We've been here like two years. So last year we took out the lawn in the backyard and planted um, plants. We've got one, in one year, we've had like 26 species of birds and nine species of butterflies in this teeny tiny yard in just one season, which I think is pretty amazing. And I'm excited to see what comes um, as the garden matures. And I think that um, if you can get people excited about that, we can make a big difference for the animals that live in our communities with us. Right on. Um, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I'd love, we, we have uh, 15 minutes left and I, I'd love, I, I know I did not get to every question and I, I've tried my best to work in a bunch, but if you'd like to unmute yourself and you can try to diplomatically ask questions to Angela, if you'd really like to hear some, or speak about something, feel free to do so. And, and I'll just say, I, my wife and I have been killing our lawn. Um, <laughs> we, 
and uh, <laughs> the first year, one of my neighbors, uh, Zana called and I, not you, Fred, but some other people said, so Hill, uh, <clears throat> what are you doing there? Uh, it's looking a little, looking a little rugged. I'm like, but by year two, I mean, it looks incredible. And the diversity of insects that I photograph in my own yard has been incredible. So yeah. it takes some time, but. Yeah, there's Xerxes a lot. Has some, Xerxes has some great materials. Yeah. I actually followed Xerxes guidelines, but can't like a suggestion how to on how to kill my lawn, so. Um, yeah, we have tons of resources on anything you can think of. Yeah. There's a lot of societal pressure to maintain like the the typical American lawn, right? Oh With, yeah. People so I started in my backyard because I wanted to prove that I could make something look nice before I dig up the front yard. <laughs> People say to me, if you don't, you don't spend an hour and a half mowing every Saturday, what are you going to do? It's like spend more time with your kids? Go hiking? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so sorry, I interrupted. Does anybody have a question for Angela? I'd have to... Oh, I could ask for some macro photography there's, tips. There's several in the chat, Jason. Ah. Um, yeah, I, I have to say, if, if you're looking for great information, um, we have a number of native plant groups here in New England and, and Wild Seed Project out of Maine, which I support and purchase seeds from to grow. It's a great source, but Xerxes has so many how, great educational how-to um, pieces on their website. Angela, if any of those are jumping out of you. Uh, okay. Well, this last one about the towns finding people if they don't mow their lawns. Yeah, I had a uh, friend. She said, if you can't beat them, join them. So infiltrate those uh, homeowners associations <laughs> and, and town halls and try and educate people about the importance of, of um, insects. Pollinators, I feel like, are an easy sale. Um, but yeah, that is a, a problem and a barrier. Um, Suzanne asked about reducing pesticide use in our towns. We do, so we have a pesticide team and we do have some, they've been working with different uh, local cities and other groups on legislation to reduce pesticide use. So you can look at, look up that information or contact me and I can put you in touch with them. Um, different cities have different um, ways of going about this. Um, in Sacramento, there's a city ordinance against using neonics on city property, but that doesn't stop, you know, private individuals. But we do have some, some guidance for that on our website. Um, and there's, a, we have a program called Bee City. So if you got people in your, your city or town excited about joining the Bee City movement. One part of that is that you have to develop an integrated pest management plan for your city, which would in, include uh, reducing pesticide use. So you could look on the Bee City website and see if they also have some sample legislation or, or ways to reduce pesticides. But it's, it's fascinating to me. My sister hates insects. She hates insects. And there was a picture of a spider. She, she texted me this picture of the spider and she's like, oh my God, I have to call the exterminator. And I find it fascinating that people are more concerned of like a bug than these poisons, especially around your pets or your kids. Like it's, it's just fascinating how we assess risk and like seeing a bug is like more risky than like having these poisons around your home. Like, I don't know. So maybe tapping into that like changing people's <laughs> threat assessment. <laughs> in, in defense of your sister, I saw this documentary called Trachophobia. <laughs> and spiders kill like thousands of people in this one town in the Midwest. They're dangerous. So obviously. Um, <laughs> she must have seen that too. You know, my, my five-year-old loves spiders. We, you know, he takes on me when we photograph stuff. He picks up everything. It's like, yeah, this is a, you know, this is a garden spider, put that down. It's a Pier Pearson spider death. Yeah, that's right, but you know, um, go going back to getting to people early. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll say, Bernard had a question about tips for macro photography, and Bernard, I wouldn't dare. Uh, in attendance tonight is uh, Brian Pfeiffer, who teaches a course, I think, about taking photography of insects, and has some great articles on his website and some great information from his blog, and I would steer you towards a real professional like Brian. Um, I am a complete hack in everything I do. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so, 
Um, a question about can we can we just introduce some more can we introduce some more insects to control the introduced species that are already here? There's a great um, Simpsons episode <laughs> about this. But. Some people have tried that. Um, the concern is that maybe the insects you introduce, even if they're a specialist to feed on a particular um, invasive weed that you're worried about, um, can adapt to feed on other species. And so then they escape and from, because they're able to adapt to this new ecosystem that they're in, maybe they start feeding on other plants other than the target plant. So it is a concern. Um, I think that biocontrol has potential, but I just think that we have to be really careful about how we do it. And, and um, especially with insects where they have those short generation times, I feel like they can adapt to things more quickly than something longer lived. Um, so it's tricky. It's, it's really tricky. Uh, I mean, the whole problem with invasive species, and it looks like Susan asked a question about, you know, pesticides versus invasive species. <sighs> yeah, um, well, and so there's different types of pesticides. So if you're talking about insecticides versus herbicides, it is labor intensive to control invasive weeds without herbicides. Um, but then you have to worry about if you're wiping out all the plants, is there anything there for the pollinators or the other insects that occur in the area? It's, it's a really difficult uh, tightrope that you have to walk. And I think that there's some people that put a lot of thought and effort into, into doing this work, restoration work really well, but it's, it's not simple by any stretch of the imagination. And then you add climate change into the mix, which <laughs> makes it even that more difficult. Yeah, we're, I, you know, here in New England, a lot of attention around emerald ash borer, EAB, and everyone's looking for it, and um, it's here. Um, and a lot of look now towards the next species, like spotted lanternfly. Um, as our climate here in New England becomes more and more similar to that of Southeast Asia, it's, it's, it's just got to be, uh, uh, it's, it's just highly likely we'll continue to perceive more and more invasive species here. Mm -hmm. it becomes more compatible. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough because it, there's not one simple answer and there are all these competing interests that you have to try and manage and make the best decisions that you can. Um, yeah. You, know, you, you mentioned that number of cities have, I think, I think you addressed that question from Suzanne about can we take steps in our towns to to limit pesticides, um, I think you did that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can check out our pesticide page. Um, I think we have some sample legislation, but if not, you could reach out to anyone on the pesticide team, and they could give you some um, some sample legislation to work on. We have worked with cities around the country, or, or they have members of our pesticide team. I don't. There's a there's a question about close related to insects about tick sprays. You have any idea about for me? Um, I mean, I I don't know. I assume that other species may also be repelled by tick sprays, but they're not. Tick sprays are more of a repellent rather than a hmm. like lethal. But I imagine that. Um, they probably do affect other other insects, other arthropods, but I don't know that much about them. I'm sorry. Asian worms and over. I don't know what you mean by overabundance of grasshoppers. <laughs> I love grasshoppers. <laughs> I'm not familiar with the leaping Asian worms. Are those the parasites that they're, cause them a, to jump into the water? The they're hair worms? A, they're a, they're a, an invasive species of worm that's been introduced here from Asia. Um, okay. That they, when, when you pull them out of the ground, uh, they, they really throw them, thrash themselves about. Um, uh, 
and there are INAT observations of them here in Vermont. Okay. Here, here locally, actually. Yeah, I don't know anything about them. Uh, grasshoppers, there are around 400 species of grasshopper in the U.S. and about 25 are pests that can uh, reach levels that do economic damage. Um, their, their numbers fluctuate quite a bit, but I know that um, people have very low tolerance for grasshoppers in their gardens. You know, I, I, one thing we, we haven't pointed out maybe in the last minute here that maybe is obvious to people, but um, you know, I, I did my PhD work with grasshopper sparrows. Ah. And um, insects, even pests, provide really important food resources for other birds, like, you know, birds, things that, those, those things we talked about getting lots of conservation dollars and the conservation attention disproportionately, probably. Um, a lot of those species entirely rely on insects for a good part of their life to survive. Yeah. And I think you know more about birds than I do, but grassland birds are one of the most imperiled groups of birds. Yeah. And grasshoppers are a really important uh, part of their diet. Well, I think is maybe there's we have time for one more question. Um, I should say, you know, if there was a question that we didn't get to, and I'm sorry we just overlooked it, um, I'm happy if you want to reach out to me via email, and I'll try to touch help you get uh, connected with some of the materials we referenced. Um, again, the the transcript from the chat tonight is going to be saved and you'll be able to download that. So a lot of people provided some really great comments from the expertise in the audience tonight. Thank you very much. And you'll be able to get all those URLs from uh, the chat when you download that. And um, Angela, anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Uh, just thanks for coming and um, yeah, we have lots of information on our, our website. Uh, okay. So check that out. And we do have a couple of staff in the Northeast. So um, if you're interested there, they do a lot of work um, on the ground restoration work and outreach. Yeah. My, my in-laws at their farm in New Hampshire are converting their old pa dairy pasture into early successional habitat. And, and ah. someone from Xerxes is helping them do that. Ah, cool. Yeah, cool. that's great. Um, well, yeah, well, I, I would just say thank you, Dr. Loss, for being so gracious with your time this evening and, and sharing your knowledge with the rest of us. I, every one of these topics, certainly honeybees and monarchs, and we, we could probably do an hour easily. I know there's tremendous interest and in a lot of questions people have about those insects. I thought this was a great um, broad overview. And as we go into the gardening season here, um, the outdoor season, uh, the non-ski outdoor season here in Vermont, that it's great to have this stuff on our mind. Um, so thank you tremendously. And um, somebody asked about a lot, a couple of how-to piece, you know, um, some more like nuts and bolts information. And I was just looking at the talks on, on Xerxes' website. And there's actually a talk in like two days about managing for pollinators, coming up with a, a pollinator management plan for working lands. Um, that's in two days, I think. And then if you go to the Xerxes and look on the events tab, you'll see that. And so somebody asked about that specifically. And um, yeah. We have all of our all of our previous webinars are on our YouTube page as well. And we just wrapped up the series of regional um, talks. So there's one for the Northeast, um, like um, creating habitat for pollinators in the Northeast that you could look up on our YouTube page. Right on. Um, well, thank you everyone for being here tonight and uh, please consider supporting. Um, if you like Suds of Science and you like this being a part of the science discussion, please consider uh, financially supporting the Vermont Center for Eco Studies and the Xerxes Societies for Conservation um, of Invertebrates. And um, if you're so inclined, please consider joining us in the Wonder Room afterwards the next half hour. It's fun. It's just fun. What else you got going on on a Tuesday night? You've already voted. You know, your day's done. So come on over to the Wonder Room and join us. Wander around and, and say hello to someone. And, and Angela, I hope you get out here to Vermont sometime. I'd love to have you out. And, yeah, I'd like to go back. It was beautiful. Well, come on out. Deal. Great. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bye.